I am John W. Swan, born 1906, I'm 97 years old. I started to work for the Illinois Central Railroad in 1927. I retired in 1973. And I've enjoyed retirement ever since, which is over 30 years. Now, um, this incident I'm going to tell you about um, concerns the shop labor. This shop labor came into the foreman's office and said, uh, he had ivy on him. He wanted to get a order to go to the doctor. So the foreman sent him to the doctor, and the doctor gave him a bottle of calamine lotion. So the man came back to work, and he went over to the uh, shop washroom, and in about a half an hour, why, uh, one of the other men came and said, uh, Ben is sick over here. I said, somebody better go see about him. So the foreman and the clerk and myself went over to the shop washroom to see what was wrong with him. And, uh, the man had drank the ball of calamine lotion, <laughs> which made him sick. So uh, the foreman says, um, what do you think we should do? And uh, I said, uh, well, I would suggest to go call the doctor and ask him what to do to help him. So he told the clerk to go call the doctor and uh, ask him what to do with him. And uh, he came back in a few minutes. He said, the doctor said, uh, get a gallon of milk. And says, pour it down on him until he vomits. And says he'll be okay, which he was. Another incident I had that uh, hit to me was uh, out the side of the uh, building, there was a big wooden box with a lid on it. And this fellow that was uh, always making jokes about every uh, 10 or 15 minutes, he come around this box and raised up the lid, and uh, the old <laughs> man got to wondering what he was looking at. So one of them says, well, "I'll go see what it was." So he goes over there and he raises the lid, and he looks down at it, and down on the bottom of it was written in a chalk. It says, "You fool, you fool, it's empty." That was it. I think that's all that I have. Thank you, John. I'm Hollis Vinson. I went by the initial of H.D. Vinson. The only thing I can say is that in my field, I was, uh, went to work in 1941, December, Retired in 78, February the 8th of 1978, 37 and a half years. And the only thing I can recall is there in the yard where I worked, I was promoted in five years after I went to work to a yard master. And we had a, a group of poets there in the yard. 
I don't know whether I ought to call his name or not, but it's it is not uh, too good to tell something unless you follow through with it. So Claude Staples wrote a little poem on the side of a car. Uh, mostly we handled coal, and he got him a piece of chalk and wrote on the side of the car. Said he's long, lean, and lanky, and lengthy is his frame. The boys all called him Goofy, and he lived up to his name. Now, most of you fellas sitting around here knows who I'm talking about. And so that went on for quite some time. And finally, the man <coughs> found out who done it, and they had, had a little trouble in the game. So some of that poetry stopped. But we had a, another yard man, switchman, by the name of Herb Vick. A Herb would come to work, and he'd work about 10 minutes, he'd lay off and go home. Well, anyone on the extra board had to be available, didn't they miss a call. And Herb would come in of the morning, he'd be singing or humming or doing something, making some noise of some kind. And somebody asked Herb, said, Herb, what in the world are you singing? He said, I God said, that anybody ought to know how to read when they hear it. But he'd come in, Arr. he'd work a while, and had another yard band there that did a little chiropractic work. Herb would go in and lay down on the eating table there in the yard man's room, and he'd call this fellow over and say, come on over here and give me an adjustment. He'd take him by the head and he'd crack that neck three or four times. Herb would get up, shake his head, get up and go back to work. But he'd, he'd call up and lay off. And he'd stay off for a week at a time. So uh, they got tied up for men and Herb had been off long enough, so they thought. So they called Herb's house, and his wife answered the phone. And Herb knew what it was all about. So he hollered at his wife, says, Yeah, Eller. Said, Bring me another dose of that red medicine. So he got out of that call. <laughs> but he was quite a character. We had another. A uh, fellow that worked with him, his little, little fella, Bill Susbury was his name. And Harmon Gwynn was running the, the crew, and I happened to be pulling pins that day. We'd work by signals, one or two or four or whatever. And Gwynn, in order to line up the cars, would take a train and he'd get four or five empty tracks and he'd start these cars down these empty tracks with one man down there catching them, going from one track to the other. Gwen hollered and said, you little short fella said, you better get them cars, they'll go down and go over the derail. Many things happen. I didn't mind working this. Daylight job when it was on the extra board or the second trick, but oh, I dreaded that third trick. I remember one night, it was 21 below zero that night. Me and Paul Hickman, Arthur Allen, Raymond Mercer, and uh, I don't recall who the fireman was. Got out there, went to work at 10.30. We stopped about 30 minutes for supper and worked till 6.30 the next day. We didn't, a train didn't come in. Our train didn't leave there. There wasn't a car left that yard all that eight hours, but we worked all night long in that 
cold weather. It was so cold, the reversing engine wouldn't work half the time on the locomotives. Go forward a while and stop it, and it would it absolutely wouldn't lay over. Just sit there and freeze. It had to get out there and beat and bang around on the side rods and get things to work it and move. But we worked all night long, and then about two or three days after that, Raymond Mercer come to me and says, you work out here the other night? I said, yeah, I sure did. Every minute of it. <clears throat> said, can you tell me what we did? I said, only thing I know, we moved up and down that switching lead all night long. We didn't move a car out of the yard. Now, what we done, I don't have any idea. <laughs> but he was a man that he believed in working, I reckon. But man standing out there in that cold weather, I'll be telling you, we absolutely froze to death. And I never will forget that night. I don't recall the date, but it was somewhere in the 60s. And it was the coldest weather that I'd ever seen on the railroad. And everybody knows that <coughs> the railroad of the graveyard is the coldest place in the world. <laughs> That's it. All right, my name's James F. Reno. My nickname's Cigar Reno. I went to work on the railroad in 19, March 1950, and we had an awful bad winter that winter, but I toughed it out. And then I worked these coal runs around these coal mines, and uh, and uh, well, let's see. And I got promoted to conductor in 55. I'd worked five years and I got promoted. And I didn't get do much of the conductor's work. Uh, and uh, we worked these coal runs. And then I went to work in Paducah on turns, worked them a while. And then I worked up to uh, October of 59 and had an accident on a motorcycle. And they disqualified me. Said I wasn't able. And I've been working ever since at public work and everything, and, and none that ever gave me any trouble from that accident. And uh, that's about all I got to say, I guess. <clears throat> My name's Walter Brown. Better known as Roundhouse Brown. Started working railroad in 1943. Paducah, Kentucky. Ended up in Central City in 1954. Retired in 79. And I wish I'd invite working because I'm too old and don't work. Thank you. My name is Dave Simpson. Started working for the IC Railroad June the 6th, 1953. In the mechanical department in Central City, Kentucky. I worked in Louisville, Princeton, and Paducah. In the mechanical department and in the storage department. I want to tell you a story about a laborer cold winter time and he <clears throat> when we roundhouse he worked at the roundhouse on the third shift above the roundhouse at that time beyond north second street south second street there was a, a house of ill repute up there and this fellow had spent the afternoon up there and he woke him up at just about a time to get down to work. It was a little bit dark in the room where he was, and he put his long handle underwear on upside down. I mean, he put his arms where the legs are supposed to be, and put his legs where the arms are supposed to be. And he went on to work. He was an alamite man out in the roundhouse, and he was thrashing around out there working, and the legs of that underwear came down by his cuffs, 
and he went over and he had Tom Campbell to get the ten snips to cut them off two or three times. And besides that, he said, this is the awfulest night I've ever had. I've been smelling poop all night long. He stuck his head through the trap door. <clears throat> now, I want to tell you about Charles Herbert Laycock. And a lazy, hazy afternoon in the summertime, not too many years ago, Roundhouse Brown was at my house, and we were having a few rounds in the kitchen of my home. It was getting toward evening and it was starting to get dark. And I turned the lights on in the kitchen, in the dining room, and the side porch. And then, about 30 minutes later, the lights went off. And I couldn't turn them on. Roundhouse said, let's go to the basement and check out the fuse box, which we did. Couldn't find anything wrong. Well, I hate to admit this, but it looks like, Mr. Brown, we're going to have to call Charles Herbert Laycock. We got Lorraine on the telephone. Well, he's out to the Tommy Gray's chicken house. He's got an old hen out there. We, <laughs> I'll get him on the CB radio and have him stop by on his way home. Charlie showed up. We showed him what the problem was. Let's go down and look at the fuse box. Now, I had heard stories about Charlie and locomotives coming into the roundhouse, and he would go out there and lay his hand on the electrical department, on the electrical cabinet, and he says, all right, nothing wrong with this engine, although the engineer had written it up that, that the engine wouldn't even pull itself, let alone a train. He laid his hand on the outside of my fuse box, he looked up in the sky, and he says, all right, let's go back upstairs. Your lights will come on in 30 minutes. Well, how do you know that, Charlie? Well, he said, I do it by faith. I have faith. Roundhouse asked him, where did you get this faith? And he said, I got it out of a washing tub in Italy in World War II. Well, how in the world did that happen? We were camped out on the side of a hill, and the captain came out, and we were at battalion level, and he said, we're going to take the next village, we're going into the next village, and it's going to be dangerous over there. We're going to have small arms fire. And some of you will not be here tomorrow. It's very dangerous because the enemy can see you, but you can't see the enemy. Now he said, I'm going back. The chaplain's going to come out, and he wants to talk with you. The chaplain made a speech out there, and he said, Now, boys, some of you need to get right. Some of you need to be baptized. You've never even been, but there's no streams around here. There's no water here. There's, there's nothing, no creeks, no rivers, lakes, ponds, nothing. But there's an old woman around there on the other side that's been washing clothes. She's agreed to let me use her wash water for baptizing since they were at battalion level, it was 15 or 20 people, soldiers, lined up to go be baptized. He put them in this washing tub and poured water on them, and they were baptized right there in Italy in the washing tub. Later on that winter, when Charlie's unit was traveling up north on a forced march, both of his feet were frozen. Charlie always had trouble with his feet being frozen. He came back and was discharged and was Louisville. And his feet was hurting. He was walking the streets looking for a job. And his feet was hurting. And it come a warm spring rain. And he sat down on the curb to, to warm his feet in this rainwater. And a cop came by and arrested him for a drunken disorderly vagrancy and resisting arrest. This was on a Friday, and Monday when he went to see the judge, he told the judge that he was not guilty of anything, any of the charges. And he told the judge his story, that his feet was frozen in Italy, and it was severe pain, and the rainwater was helping his feet. And the judge asked him what outfit he was with 
in Italy, and he told him. And he said, I was in that same outfit. Do you remember the time that the chaplain came out and told us we were going to be in danger the next day, and he baptized some of us in the wash water? Charlie said, absolutely. I was baptized in that water, and the judge says, I was baptized in the same water that you was baptized in. Get that smart mouth cop over here. You're absolutely innocent. And if you bring that man in here one more time, I'll have the chief to take your badge. Charlie Laycock, wife Lorraine, painted this picture behind me. This is Crab Station in Paducah. This is a passenger station with the freight office at one end, the passenger part on the other end. Charlie's lived up here behind this place. Charlie had two mean brothers, stepbrothers. They were making moonshine whiskey right up here in these woods. When they raided them, Charlie's dad came down here and he met Charlie up here when he was going coming home from school. And he was barefooted. And he said, it's just, Daddy told him it's about time for the train to come. And we'll get on this train and go to Louisville. He had relatives in Louisville. He said, these rocks are hurting my feet. And he, Daddy took the shoes off and gave them to Charlie. And Charlie put them on. And Charlie was about 15 years old. And he only had money enough to buy him a half fare ticket. And so he put his shoes on. He went in there and they caught the, they hid in the restroom. And the passenger train come by and picked him up. And the conductors came by and looked at him. And he was laying down on the seat with a newspaper over him. His dad said, we'll cover you up here so they won't know how old you are. And he, looked at his, and, he, and, he, and he looked at his feet, and he saw those big shoes down there. How old is this boy? He said, he's not but 11 years old. Yeah, but he's 11 years old, but he's wearing size 11 shoes. How could that be? This is an, uh, uh, an error on this freight station over here. He has a CRIB crib station. Uh, it is actually K-R-E-B, crib. And uh, this photograph here was taken in about 1921, and Lorraine painted this picture uh, from the photograph. And that's all I have for you. And thank you so, so much. My name's James Collier. Everybody call me Buddy Collier. And I worked on the railroad from 1967 to uh, 1994. Uh, they retired me when I got hurt, hurt my back. And the uh, most memorable story was when I hard in on a railroad, you worked from Louisville to Central City, and usually you was home every other day. The second week, I caught a work train. I didn't know anybody, in, anybody on the work train, and two of them happened to be alcoholics. <laughs> and what we was doing was loading, uh, unloading uh, poles for Louisville Gas and Electric. And we headed in at Shively and met a train and then headed out. Well, I didn't know it till that afternoon when we come back, we'd left the flagman there. So we worked all day and we got ready to come back in. The engineer said, you better go back on the caboose, buddy. So I went back there and the conductor, which he's not working anymore and I ain't gonna call his name, he was passed out on the floor. <laughs> and the flagman, I didn't know where he was at. And the foreman for Louisville Gas and Electric, he was half drunk. And he said, engineer said, buddy, he said, make sure everybody's out of the way and we'll go back to Louisville. So we get back uh, to Shively and there's a flagman. He's flagging me down and he's all bruised up, cut up. I said, what happened to you? Well, he didn't catch the caboose. He fell off and rolled in the gravels. Well, I get almost to the yard office at Louisville and the conductor getting out of the floor. And he got up and he got in the yard, yard office somehow and registered in. And uh, that was my first time working with a couple of drunks on the railroad. Now, everybody on the railroad would like to play tricks. Eddie Reed, he's here, and he always had this uh, one brakeman that couldn't wait to get in. And uh, he come in, and he set his grip down on, on a little booth, and uh, he's going to take the engines to the roundhouse. Well, Eddie took everything out and nailed it down with a couple of spikes. And this guy comes running by to get his grip, and he grabbed a hold of the handles, and his feet just flew right straight up in the air, and he hit the ground. 
And then uh, one trip, now, he never told me he'd done it, but somebody put a brick in my grip, and I carried it around for about two or three weeks <laughs> before I finally figured out I had a, a brick in my grip. And uh, I put a couple of knuckle pins, which weighed about three or four pounds a piece in people's grips and stuff like that. We had this one guy, he's an engineer now, and he's always real neat and real clean. And he didn't want anybody getting, he'd never want to get dirty or anything. Well, Eddie and me would been down at a uh, novelty place, and he bought a couple of things that would shock you. He bought a lighter. If somebody opened it up, it would shock them, or a pen. Well, I bought this artificial dog poop. <laughs> and this guy walked in. He set his grip down. He walked out, and I just laid that dog poop right on top of his grip. He come back in, and he looked at it, and all. Oh, he just had a look on his face. He said, who in the world would have done that? Which I just reached down and grabbed and stuck it in my pocket. He said, oh, buddy, don't do that. I took him out and showed him it was just fake. It was rubber and everything. But I enjoyed working on the railroad. Uh, had a lot of good friends, a lot of good times. and That's about all I want to say. My name's Eddie Reed. I hired in 1957 and retired in 1999. I hired in about all five or six months before the steam engine left and diesels come. I hired in switching at Central City and kind of not working very much while I transferred to Louisville and worked out on the road from Louisville to Central City there for several years. Uh, I, couple, most of the stuff that I know is on myself, so I won't uh, repeat none of that. But uh, I do know of occasion there in Central City, this engineer at night, you had some that would give a signal, backup signal like this. And, of course, he could be a mile away from you, and they'd expect him to see him. Well, he complained to this one yard foreman, told him, said, you're going to have to give me a bigger signal, something that I can see. And DuPont Edwards, I'm told, got up on the coal house where, where they supplied the cabooses with coal and tied a rope, about a 10-foot rope, and just swung it around in a circle. And they said, that engineer, he said, now that's the kind of signals I see, you know. <laughs> And, of course, they tell on uh, Clyde Allen, I don't know if it's true or not, because railroaders has a tendency to lie, you know. But they said they was leaving uh, Greenville, and they had a large train of coal, and track was wet and everything else, and between Sun City and Greenville, you've got a pretty good hill. So they just decided that uh, before they even leave, they just cut off and bring half the train to Central City and then go back for the rest. And said, uh, now, they told it on Clyde Allen, and said uh, with, they didn't tell him that they was going to take half the train in. Of course, it was night and all that, and he was on a steam engine, and, and said they went back there, and they just cut off half the train and, and told Clyde to go ahead, you know, and said he worked the throttle of that steam engine, the sand and everything else, and he worked it and got it up top of the hill and said he stood up and said, y'all didn't think old Clyde could do it, did you? And they said, do what, Clyde? said, pull this hill. They said, well, Clyde, half your train's still back down on the flat track, you know. But uh, I'm like Buddy Collier. I had a lot of friends out there, and I enjoyed it. And then it was rough now. It, it wasn't an easy life. But uh, that's, that's about it. Thank you. My name is Andrew L. Hawes. I started to work for the Illinois Central Railroad March the 1st in 1951 steam engine. Uh, made my first trip, first student trip. They put me on an engine here at Central City. I went to Louisville. And those big engines then were, when they went around those curves, and there's some sharp curves on the, but on the north end, and as you went around them, it, it looked like the engine was going to the thicket all the time. It, you know, the engine didn't turn when I thought it should, and it worried me quite a bit, but I gripped my hands and my teeth real hard. Next day, my mouth was sore, and I couldn't figure it out. I finally figured out that I had gritted my teeth so hard that it was sore from it. But that I worked, I retired or sold out in 86, May the 1st, 86. There was a lot of humorous things that happened in this time. Uh, one of them was already, some of it was told a while ago. I happened to be there. I was firing on this job when this happened with a Mr. Allen, Mr. Clyde Allen, fine old fellow, but he's like myself. He, he had problems, 
being able to read or write, and we did everything in the world to them. We were young and didn't have much sense and did everything to aggravate him. And one of them was he wanted us to read the orders and so forth real quick. Of course, we'd get them, put them in our pocket, and act like we didn't have them. And he'd say, read those orders. What does it say? What are we going to do? Right, we'll let you know after a while. <laughs> but that was bad. But he was always 64. He'd been 64 for several years. One day, a uh, brakeman on the job, we were going out at Candy Creek Bottom. Brakeman on the job says, Mr. Allen, how old are you? He said, I'm 64 and a half. He said, you know, I was over to the flea market today, and I met a man look just like you. And I asked him, and he said he was your twin brother. And he said he was 72. I said, how can that be? Well, it made the old man real mad. He jumped up, and he says, if you, bad word, say another word to be a knight, got a monkey wrench put in his lap, I'll knock you in the head. <laughs> well, in this condition, we hushed. I wasn't working very regular anyway, and I didn't care to stay out there all night. to make no difference. I need the money. But he rode with this monkey wrench in his lap. Willard Ray was the brakeman's name. We came back to the main line, and we had 18 cars, and some of them were empties we had picked up over at Zen Masters at Greenville. And we started up the hill. Got up there, and, it, and he, it was raining, and he slipped up, and he quit. He couldn't pull it. Well, Willard Ray said, uh, got up, looked to me, which I don't know what looked, but said, I'm going back and to cut the engine off. I want you to sand the rail up the top of the hill, come back, get this train, go over. Because it, it's not enough to double that hill with. Well, Clyde, I said, okay. So he went back on my side, gave me a signal to go ahead. I, I thought Clyde heard it. He didn't. We went over the hill with the engine. And he went down the other side to a siding over there at Mercer where we could set the cars out. He thought he had half his train. didn't have anything but engine. He had... There were sharp curves coming down the hill. On a locomotive engine was a engine brake and a train brake, and he was drawing off the train brake and bleeding the engine brake off, so he had no brake at all. He was just rolling free. And we'd go around those curves. We got awful fast coming down there, but I didn't say a word because he done told me not to say one. When we got to about right, he stopped about right to show the cars in the siding. He looks at me and said, what are they saying over there? I said, Clyde, there's nobody to say nothing because you don't have nothing but an engine. He looked at me just a minute and he said, what? And I tell him again, he said, he called me two or three good bad names about this time. He's really mad because he's really disturbed about, he had to retire at 65. He knew somebody was going to get out that he was older. He was really disturbed. I knew that. He told me not to speak to him, so I didn't. But when I said he had nothing, he turned his headlight on. He said, I'd better have a train. He turned his headlight on. Of course, you can see a mile up the track. There wasn't nothing up there. We go back over that hill. He, I hang out the window because I can't stand it. He, he bears me under every tie as he go back. He, I back over there to the train. Conductor, he's done walked over. hunting us. <laughs> we get off the train. We come over that hill. Not a bit of trouble. Come to town. But as long as he lived, he retired about a week or two later. I had nothing to do with it. But, uh, but he he always thought I did. You could ask him, he's the only reason I'm retired, that old horse boy down there did it. <laughs> but I didn't. But the rule was he had to retire at 65. He was already 72 and he was still working, which was great with me, of course. He left me a job when he went, so I guess I ought to appreciate it, but I, I didn't do it. As, it was uh, th 35 years. It, it was a good job. It was an awful good job, I thought, when I went to work. And I was working for 75 cents an hour and went making this Mr. Red Frog told us a while ago, $11, $11 something for an eight hour day. And that was a pretty good raise for me and family, and so forth. And I met a lot of good people and had a lot of good friends. And I've been fortunate that I've lived to be. 77 anyway so I guess that's about all I have to say
My name's Bedford Vincent, and I went to work on the railroad in uh, June of 52 and retired in uh, October of 94. Uh, I had I had a lot of good a lot of good times on the railroad, I guess. Uh, Cause just before a little time before I retired, why well, Eddie Reed come up and worked with me. So, but anyway, probably some of the things I remember most. I, I worked with uh, Hoss Craig a lot, Ogden. About all of them know him, and uh, but I never will forget uh, one time I was working extra board. This was a long time ago, I was working extra board. Him and Shelby Jones was on a job together. <clears throat> I can't remember who the conductor was, probably Emmett Tudor or somebody, but he laid off and Odgan got to run the job and I went out as flagman on it. Shelby was the swing brakeman on the coal run. We got out there at uh, Vogue Mines. We was gonna have to go in there and they'd had a, they had a box car sitting there on the lead. It was gonna have to spot in there. So we dropped the caboose by and when they come back out, uh, Pal Harrison, he was, uh, he was the head brakeman on the job at the time. He didn't throw the main line switch and run right back through it there. I rode the caboose down the main. Anyway, we fooled that switch a little bit. We couldn't do nothing with it, so finally had to call. They called Central City over the radio. And when they told them we'd run through the switch while Hollis Wortham was he was on 70 there. He said, I'll be down there just in a few minutes. <laughs> so, but the funny part about it, Craig come over to me. He said, now, when Hollis gets here, said, we'll just let on like Shelby's the conductor. Said, he won't say, of course, I said, he won't say anything to Shelby. But <laughs> and that always, that always tickled me every time I thought about it, knowing Odgen, because that's, that's the way he was. But I... I enjoyed working on the railroad. I, I was I thought about one thing. It uh, since the caboose is sitting out there at the Y, and a lot of them had to do that when we first hard in. It was six miles out there to about six miles to Caney Creek Mines, and we of a night of a night just like last night, we got on the end of those empties. Didn't put no caboose. Got on the end of those empties, and no radios at that time. Just your laner and two or three fusees in your pocket, two of you get on there and, and ride, that's six miles. I just thought about it, I hated last night to have to get on there and rode out there, but of course railroad changed, it changed a lot. Uh, I went to, I went to service in 56, we still had some steam engines and when I came out in 58, why, we had dieselized completely and like I say, in, during that time, we got radios and, and things changed a lot. I guess that's about all I had to say. Like they was guiding the caboose, you know, backing up or something. And this this one conductor on the north end, he had a young boy, just was a student, you know, learning. And the conductor was standing there like he was backing up around them curves and all that, you know. and. He told this boy, said, uh, now, this, you've got to do this. said, you might as well learn now, you know. Of course, it didn't have no bearing at all on the steering. Aid. That was just a handbrake. Well, that old boy got up there, and he he was working that steering wheel, you know, and he he turned and go around them curves. And, of course, the conductor said, oh, said, you're doing a fine job. He said, yeah, but I thought I was going to lose it on that last curve back there. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, hang on now. And then we had this other guy. Uh, we were picking up at Clarkston, and... Uh, they decided they wanted to hold off. Well, they done cut off the engine, and they coupled it back up because they wanted to hold on to a, a car. And so he, the young brakeman, he coupled up, and, and then he gave the engineer a go-ahead signal with this one car. He's just going to go about 30, 40 feet and back in, pick up a car. Well, this engineer thought we wasn't picking up. Well, I was back on the caboose with the only radio we had on the train. And anyway, while the engineer, he just took off. And here's this young boy hanging on the side, and of course, the conductor, he come running back there to me, said, Eddie, said, holler at him, holler at him. Said, the boy's still hanging on when they went around the curb about a half a mile. Said, I'm afraid he's going to fall off and get killed or something. Anyway, so I finally hollered and hollered and had him on the radio, couldn't get him. And then we sat there, of course, we was worried too, you know. And 
about five, ten minutes later while we could hear him blowing for a crossing coming back. And so we got there while the conductor, man, he tore that engineer up, you know. He said, well, how far did you go before you ever looked back? He said, oh, said I just went around the curve down here. So he asked the brakeman on there. He said, well, he stopped at Litchfield. That's when he looked back. <laughs> about five, six, seven miles that boy was hanging on. Now, buddy, you had something? No, that's what I wanted to Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, I had this one that uh, they said he was, the engineer was tongue-tied, and the car man, you know, was also tongue-tied. And, and said the uh, car man come up there and told him, said, that you break or something, you know, and said, uh, the engineer stuck his head out and said, are you mocking me? He said, no, th I talk to you like you. said, I tongue-tied too, you know. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I'm Galen Sperlin, and I hard in with the uh, Illinois Central Railroad, uh, March the 13th, 1973. Uh, did different type jobs over my lifetime, and that's one of the best jobs I ever had. It was mainly not because of uh, not because of the railroad as such, even though it was probably one of the largest employers in the county, in Muhlenberg County at one time, uh, and it was probably one of the best paying jobs in Muhlenberg County at one time. Uh, but it was mainly the people that you worked with on the railroad. Uh, Illinois Central Railroad was uh, always known as, uh, it had the main line of Mid-America, but it also had the family line. And uh, it seemed like that's, you either had to know someone to get that job very well or had to be kin to somebody on the railroad. And uh, as I say, uh, it was mainly the people that worked on the railroad that made it such an enjoyable railroad, even though that for many years uh, it did uh, uh, help. It was the income that I made that uh, supported my family and, uh, and so forth. I no longer worked for the railroad, and I did not retire from the railroad, but it was uh, mainly the uh, railroad left me. It was uh, when the Pitt, Paducah, and Louisville Railroad bought uh, the section from the Illinois Central then we, a lot of us had to uh, go and work at other locations and so forth. And then later I uh, resigned from the railroad and, and had taken the present job that I have now. Uh, really missed the railroad. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, lot of people that worked on the railroad that were uh, 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 really upstanding people, a lot of people that were funny. Uh, that did a lot of different things and uh, it seemed like a lot of people on the railroad always wondered when we first went to when I first went to work on the railroad why so many people had different jobs and always had other things that they did and it was just for the simple reason that when you went to work on the railroad uh, you always worked the extra board and the extra board is uh, was something that uh, when you went to work you just kind of uh, uh, worked when they called you when somebody was off you worked vacations and I had 16 years on the railroad and out of that 16 years probably 12 years were working the extra board uh, a Mr. Jimmy Hayes when I hired in was a clerk on the railroad and I'll never forget sitting down and and uh, probably the very first day that I worked and and uh, these people that I'm that I'll name is people that broke me in and it was uh, became very close to and uh, Mr. Jimmy Hayes probably uh, was a very uh, uh, excellent clerk on the railroad and had spent many years, and I'm not real sure, but I think he had in probably about 40 years with the railroad when he retired. But he said, uh, son, you'll never need to know any other job because you'll work here the rest of your life. Said, uh, you'll never have to know. But well, that didn't turn out because years uh, went by and uh, the railroad industry uh, started faltering and uh, so it went down, so we all seemed like when somebody retired, uh, then uh, we would always think, well, we'll get to move up, but they never would replace that job. So that was just uh, the way the railroad was, and that's why other people had different jobs, because you always worked two days a week, and you had to do, either do carpenter work or farm or do something else or work for somebody else during those early years when you first started on the railroad. But uh, again, it was a very interesting job. Uh, we probably don't have enough time to just name all the stuff that we talk about on the railroad, the different things that happened and, uh, and so forth. I remember many people on the railroad, engineers and, and uh, conductors, brakemen, flagmen, and all your switchmen, especially all your section people that worked on the railroad that kept everything going. 
but uh, and clerks and operators and I was a clerk and an operator but uh, a lot of funny things happened it seemed uh, in the first years that I worked uh, a lot of different things happened on the railroad uh, uh, one for one instance we used to have a printout of uh, every day at noon we'd have a printout and I was pretty much mischievous I guess on the railroad and trying to have we had a lot of fun and, and just the nature of my personality of liking to uh, people to laugh and have a good time while we work but anyway uh, Mr. Bobby Ware was uh, foreman at uh, the Central City Roundhouse and uh, we got a noon report every day and uh, we'd get this noon report in and it would from Chicago and it would be a printout and we'd put it in all the department heads would receive that and we read it and uh, it was promoting so many people and it had different lines promoting so I uh, kind of took the old card punch machine, took the cards out, and uh, reprinted some more cards promoting Mr. B.T. Wire at the Central City Roundhouse to a new position, congratulating him, and put all this back in and ran it again. Well, needless to say, I sent that to the Roundhouse, and, uh, and the Roundhouse foreman then started calling his superiors, and uh, the Illinois Central Railroad was rather large, so therefore it went from Paducah to Chicago and everywhere else. He was wanting to know where he was going to have to move to because it looked like he'd been promoted. Uh, of course, the next day he found out that Galen Sperlin promoted him, not uh, an official. So I was instructed then that I'd never work again at the Central City Roundhouse. A <laughs> uh, lot of different things happened. Uh, Eddie Reed seemed to be always the one, and Bob Tigg, the late Bob Tigg, uh, always seemed ones that uh, you were always tickled to see of the morning when you come in to work, uh, getting out on the Clarkson local. They would start and uh, start talking to each other and, uh, and going on with different things, and uh, sometimes you'd think they'd fight, but the next thing you know, they was uh, sharing either uh, some tobacco or cigarettes or something with each other but they was always in trouble and I uh, knew that they thought a world of each other but uh, anyway that some of the I had uh, a friend to come in one day to ask me about something uh, on the railroad and Bob Tigg and Eddie Reed was in there arguing and fighting and he thought they were big enemies and to later find out that they wasn't but uh, different things a lot of different things have happened uh, some things of uh, local interest Carly Mitchell of Carl Mitchell's son uh, equipment down here worked on the railroad and became a real good friend of mine uh, one night he come with an old truck uh, hauling equipment and uh, come in it didn't have the heater wasn't working and it was uh, probably in January and very cold and the defroster wasn't working so he put a put some paper up, cardboard up over the windshield just half of it in front of the driver's window so as soon as he left uh, I kind of went out and slid the cardboard over to the other side so the next morning when he uh, came back in off the train well the only place he could see out was the passenger side not the driver's side so then a gene then there was a Harold Clark that one day his wife always made sure that he sent the garbage she'd send the garbage with him to throw away and back then we just used barrels to burn barrels to put the garbage in and he had two of those full, and he had dumped those on the way and left them in the back of his pickup. So I started a family feud there when I took all the garbage in the clerk's office, went out and filled the barrels back up again. And he hauled it back home. And uh, she went out to get the barrels out of the truck next morning. She didn't much like that either. So uh, we shot a lot of firecrackers, and we shot a lot of Roman candles during the, the course of things. And uh, the railroads, it's... Uh, was a very enjoyable place to work and uh, with the people that became a family and uh, to this day uh, it's like a lot of things so I could continue to tell a lot of different stories but uh, those stories would only be really funny to the people that lived them and the people that uh, we worked together and uh, the railroad uh, at the time that people were working was a family uh, it is still a family for those that are left that uh, work and of course it's fewer and fewer of those because of age and just because of jobs uh, it was true as I had said first that Jimmy Hayes told me that you'll have a job son for the rest of your life here well that doesn't hold true anymore we all have four or five different occupations now in our age but uh, 
I can truly say that the railroad was one of the best jobs that I'd ever had in my life. Just sit down there. Be, be fine. Okay. Whatever, whatever you want to say. Okay. Just give your name and when you start to work for the railroad, when you retire. Okay. I started the seventh month of July and the six, uh, seventh month of July, sixth day of July, 1944. And your name is? Cecil Heath. And I worked, uh, the, I worked all them years, the uh, 86th, 29th day of August when they shut down. And I worked with a lot of good people. And uh, railroad, all right. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Time yesterday. I'll, I'll do it now. All right, my name's Charles Greenwood. I started work in 1965 as a machinist apprentice. And I had to go to Paducah to serve part of my apprenticeship. And I come back to Central City in 68. 1970, I was promoted to a foreman. I went to Chicago was a foreman at Woodcrest, which was a big shop up in uh, Homewood. Uh, I got diabetes up there. I quit that foreman's job and come back to Central City in 73. I worked uh, assistant foreman's off and on and in uh, then when Paducah and Louisville bought the railroad in 87, I had to go to Paducah to work. And I stayed working at Paducah until I retired in 2002. Now, you know, of course, the only funny story I guess I've got to say was when, when I was, of course, Woodcrest up in Chicago, they had a lot of weird people working for the railroad, <laughs> I'd say. But what I know, I was general foreman that night, and uh, we had two dope heads, I guess you'd say, that uh, they decided they were going to steal some machinery out of there. Well, they were loading up the trunk of their car, and I caught them, and they took off running, and I run one across the parking lot and caught one of them. But, you know, I don't know. I had to go to court two or three times, but uh, I don't know whatever happened to him. But I enjoyed working the railroad. I was a machinist and worked on locomotives, different things, worked on Cabooses some, whenever they were tore up, we'd have to repair them. That's why I took over this, getting the caboose settled in here for the rails to trails, and done a lot, quite a bit of work on it, but it looks real nice. I'm proud of it. Thank you. All right. Dean Hyde. Uh, his uh, brother was a train master, and they got where they, they t said he'd go blow his horn to his brother all the time. <laughs> he didn't go wrong, you know. It, I don't think it was true, but you know. <laughs> what about Buckethead? Buckethead Tate. Uh, he was on the north end. Yeah, he had road. a head about the size of a bucket, you know. He come by that name on us. When, we, when we're also, for the sake of this tape, when Eddie and myself, when we say north end, south end, yeah. if you hadn't heard before, north end's from Central City to Louisville, and south end was Central City to Paducah. So right. everybody, we've got, we had names for everything, and that's what, Hacksaw. Yeah, now I, I'm not saying how he come by that name. No, but, uh, we don't know. We're not real yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beetle Bailey. Now yeah, that, Beetle, he... he he come by that name on us. His last name was Bailey. It's Beetle Bailey. Uh, Beetle Bailey. He was the one that worked on the cabooses all the time. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he did the maintenance on them yeah, too, and Charlie. Yeah, the engines and, <laughs> and everything else. It didn't matter. He yeah. just took it on to himself. Yeah. If something was wrong yeah. with it, he'd want to work yeah. on it. <clears throat> yeah, he'd give him a screwdriver and pliers, and he'd, he'd go. Of course, the story about him, too, about Beetle's, a lot of stories we could tell, but uh, when uh, Jim Smith and uh, David Reed bought the uh, Mm -hmm. P and L when they bought this section uh, 
from Paducah to Louisville from the ISC. They came in in a helicopter one day down at Central City to check it out for some reason. And the story goes that uh, Beetle was getting out on train. Marvin Bailey, I guess we yeah, should say. Yeah. Marvin Bailey, when he was getting out on train conductor, and when they said the helicopter landed, we all know what the dust throws up and everything. And they said when the dust settled, there was <laughs> Marvin looking in the windows of the helicopter to see who was in it. So he was always either working on something or he yeah. knew what was going yeah. on. But uh, Redbird. Now, Redbird, he was a North End, and when he hired in, he wore a red jacket all the time, which he <laughs> wasn't supposed to do, kind of the color, you know. But that name stuck with him till the day he died. Hmm. Chili. Chili Harris was an old conductor here at Central City. I don't know how he got the name. He's on Mercer Job. Yeah. Mercer Job, okay. Mercer yeah. Job, another name of a train. Yeah. The Mercer Job was run at, uh, the one that uh, ran on the rails for trails. Yeah. Now yeah. that yeah. that very track, yeah. that was the Mercer Drop and old line switcher. Yeah. Old line. You worked the old line switchers. Yes, a little. You always yeah. was a north. But now at the end, when the PNL took over, we'd go to Greenville and work at uh, Reed Manual and yeah. stuff up there. You that's know. right. But Before where the rails for trails yeah. is now, uh, that section from Central City to to uh, Greenville was uh, the old line switcher worked it every day, and it yeah. was twelve oh one at noon every day. It was pretty well listed. If there's something going. On. And then the Mercer switcher was 11.59 yeah. of a night. Yeah, and the reason we night. remember that, he was always <coughs> calling the crews mm -hmm. for him and so forth. And we had a guy out of the south end by the name of... Chrome Dog. <laughs> uh, he bald-headed, <laughs> but he kept it shined. But uh, he, yeah, he got that name. Got the choo-choo baby. That was W.J. Miller in Louisville. He hired in. During the war, they'd hire them under 18 years of age, you know. Otherwise, you had to be 18. But during the war, they got short of men, and they, they, they were hiring them. And they called them Choo Choo Babies, and he was one of them. Bull, Bull Durham. Yeah, that's Bob Durham now. They called him Bull Durham, you know, at uh, how he got that name. Uh, Scrap Iron was uh, uh, Efton Kinder. He was rough. He was an engineer, but he was rough. He'd and, make scrap iron out of the He'd make scrap iron out <laughs> on the hillside. You see knuckles and draw bars. And then the big old, he was a union leader for the Order of Conductors. Chili dog. Chili dog. He was a switchman. Then Baggy Thompson, he was a switchman here at Central City. And then there was a guy, his byword was I God. And Earl Latham from Orangeboro. <laughs> Everything was I God this and I God that, you know. Here's a local guy yeah, that everybody knows. Yeah, Cigar Reno. Everybody knows Cigar. Of course, he had a cigar guest in his mouth all the time. And as we talked about uh, before, the IC was a family line, yeah. and uh, Seagard worked on it, and his son is still it's, working for yeah. the P&L now. James Reno, they called him Rhino, because he's about as rough as a Rhino, <laughs> you know. And, and then, he's another scrap iron yeah, engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then Pinhead, that was nickname for Buddy Collier, because yeah. he had a little head there, and, <laughs> but it, it didn't bother him. And then the car man was Big, uh, big Daddy. Yeah. Now here's a favorite. Migraine. Now that's that's they, my nickname. That's what I don't know because he give everybody migraine or he was about as bad as a migraine. Well, they said it was because I gave him a yeah. headache talking too yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> then we got Otis Benson, uh, Kenny. Uh, Kenny. Kenny, Kenny Benson, Benson, and they called him Otis because he looked just like Andy Griffith's Otis on television, <laughs> and they he got hung with that. Now we got uh, couple, Golden Arm. Golden Arms and the next guy, they gave themselves this nickname. It, you know, all these other nicknames, somebody else gave them. But now Golden Arms was Sheridan Aubrey. And he, he called himself Golden Arms, and he liked to be called Golden Arms because he said he was so smooth in operating that brake and throttle, you know, <laughs> that he just, they just called him Golden Arm. But he, like I said, he gave it. And then we have uh, Mike Miller. He come to work with the railroad. He was called Monk Miller. Well, it wasn't long after he was promoted, he wanted us to call him Marvelous Monk Miller. <laughs> well, we did for about two or three years, and then he come along and wanted us to call him Marvelous Monk Miller the Magnificent. <laughs> and we thought that was a little bit too much. But, I mean, you had to work with this guy. I said, that was one of the reasons I retired. And, uh, and uh, Monk Miller, Mike Miller, again, again, his dad was uh, a, a section track foreman, foreman. Yeah, track, track foreman, foreman, good track yeah, foreman. Aubrey Miller. That's Aubrey right. Miller. Uh, and he had a brother that also was, uh, he was a track yeah, foreman yeah, down in Paducah, yeah. wasn't he? I'll tell you, I can some more. Clarence Kelly, Kelly, and, uh, and, uh, what, uh, Clarence Kelly. What Mobley. Mobley. Mm -hmm. Rastus Allen. Rastus Allen. That was all old head switching. Because uh, this, Staples. this railroad was so 
so large in the county and, and so big of an employer, there's a lot of people who are touched about everybody's family, especially yeah, in the Central yeah. City area. Now, an uncle got me my job, Hollis mm -hmm. Benson, uh, asked me, you know, if I wanted. But like Squirling said, it, it was kind of a family thing. And uh, Either that or you had a good friend. That, you had a good friend that worked on the railroad, mm -hmm. but everybody, every family got touched by the railroad at one time in this, in this area just mm -hmm. because it was such a large... Yeah. Uh, I forget the date, but in uh, Greenville, in Greenville, the uh, Muenberg County Courthouse, out front, at one time, uh, there's a big plaque. Mm -hmm. There's a rock sitting out front that has a, a big uh, plaque on it uh, from the, uh, uh, I guess it would probably be in the 50s. I think it because was. Because it was the 100 years or something anniversary of the Illinois Central yeah. Railroad, and they gave uh, these plaques to every county seat that they ran well, through. Well, Central the City had one, too. I don't know. But that's really if it's neat. Still there, Owensboro. Mm -hmm. all, all, like I said, any the county seat and the uh, cities that it ran through. They been, and that's a large amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, today, when you go to the airports and stuff, uh, it reminds me of what the railroad would have been before yeah. my lifetime, yeah. before yeah. the passenger service, before my lifetime. I I symbol that is that's what the railroad was like. Mm -hmm. It was like the airports and the airlines are now. You know, and it was just so big. Uh, and the thing about railroading too is, uh, wouldn't it be something? And not, I have a daughter that's 19, and and she's saw because of her dad's love for the railroad and worked on the railroad and stuff. Uh, she uh, says, you know, even the young folks looking back yeah. now, if, if we could more trains haul more freight and more rail service, look at the safety of the highways would be with, and not denying those truckers their jobs yeah. of driving because those same guys that's driving those trucks would have jobs on the railroad if the railroad was booming <coughs> we'd still have the same amount of people working in the railroad yeah. be good jobs and trucks but we'd get that transport the fuel economy of a railroad yeah gosh y'all used to pull 70 tons of i mean uh, 70 red eye cars and we're talking 100 and we're talking 100 you know 75 yeah.